Time to step away from reviews for a bit, because how does one review a game such as this? Blaseball is a community-driven browser game that plays out like a season of baseball over the course of a week. Monday to Friday is the season, Saturday is the off-season, and Sunday is when the election results come out. All games on a given day play out together over the first half of an hour. The splort is almost exactly like baseball, but with extra rules and weather conditions that get added with each season, and get increasingly more troubling. How the community plays into this whole experience, you ask? Well, in a direct sense, by voting. When you first register an account, you pick a team to support. Each time that team wins, you gain some cash you can use to buy votes, or place bets on games for big payouts. There's more ways to build cash that have been added, but I'd be dating this video hard explaining them all, knowing they'll most likely add more. With your votes, however, you can elect a single decree for the season. Previous decrees include things like peanuts, which we will revisit, and alternate reality versions of players replacing existing ones. There are also blessings to be voted on, and each blessing is granted based on a lottery of all the team's votes, and usually involves one or more players getting buffs, or other strange things we will also revisit. In an indirect sense, the community shapes the world of Blazeball. They give players personality, appearances, some people roleplay them on Twitter. They give them stories and character arcs to reflect how the game is evolving. They idolize them and receive gifts in return. When they pass, or just switch to a different team, they mourn them. They give the teams themes, chants, goals to aspire towards, and the developers take a lot of these broader ideas and implement them, work with them, turn them back on the community in a maddeningly low crafty and fashion. The only way I can truly convey what all this means is to recap the events so far leading to the end of Season 8. But before that, let's talk about my personal experience with baseball. So you see, I didn't grow up somewhere regular baseball was common. We had Rounders, which is baseball for babies, and in 2018 I just started watching baseball anime, and now I know too much about baseball and had nowhere to put all that knowledge. Q baseball which I first heard about on Waypoint Radio. I only really had a vague idea what it was all about, so I went to the site, registered, and chose to be a fan of the Hades Tigers. I chose them because I don't live in any of these American cities, and this is... strangely off-putting for Canada. The Sunbeams and Tacos didn't exist as unreal places at the time, so Hades was the only place I could... relate to. Since then, I've been committed to the Tigers, through thick and thin. As such, most of my knowledge about the inner workings and storyline centers around them. So the following recap of events will be from that perspective. Season 1 was before my time. Probably before most people's time. The most I can tell you about that is the Philly Pies beat the Chicago Firefighters in the finals, and the elections decreed that the Forbidden Book be opened though with much of its information redacted, and slowly unveiled over the preceding seasons. With that, the solar eclipses began, the Moabi Desert is swallowed by the Hellmouth, creating the Hellmouth Sunbeams, the rogue umpires emerge, and ace pitcher Jalen Hotdog Fingers is incinerated. The Discipline Era began, and as far as we know, has yet to end. In Season 2, the Philly Pies once again seized victory this time from the Charleston Shoe Thieves, but not before a further 16 players are incinerated. It should be noted that 1. The weather effect that denotes a player as the potential to be incinerated is a solar eclipse, and 2. When a player is killed, they are replaced by a player from that same team's shadows. No Tigers players were incinerated this season. I wasn't around then, but it's important to note. The election at the end of the season saw the emergence of Peanuts, and much consequences, and the bottom four teams gained access to the fourth strike for Season 3, a considerable advantage that got the New York Millennials to the finals next season. For the Tigers, 
Fan favorite five star hitter Jessica Telephone was stolen from the Philly Pies. This rather drastic move would go on to stop the Pies winning streak and put the Tigers on top. Season 3 is where things get spicy. To begin, 28 players were incinerated, the last of which being the Tigers' own Landry Violence, an incorporeal player known for possessing a different hitter at the start of each game. A dramatic way to end the season and the Tigers' first championship victory as the crowd chanted rest in violence. RIV was later to become every incinerated player's honour, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Season 3 was the start of the peanut plague, with varying effects from every player named Dan having that name replaced with peanut, to peanuts becoming so prominent that they literally poured from the sky. Yet somehow, the commissioner still saw fit to charge us for the privilege of eating them. As a weather effect, players could eat peanuts mid-game and have a reaction, and with peanuts came birds, which had no effect until later seasons. During the season, games ground to a halt when someone tried to cheat the system and illegally obtained millions of peanuts. Thus was the first appearance of the Shelled One, an eldritch deity that we are more or less subject to the whims of. All games were halted while searching for the perpetrator, but ultimately, baseball is inevitable and play resumed shortly after. This event was considered blasphemy, and the peanut plague now became the season of uncertainty. A few days later, during a game between the Charleston Shoe Thieves and the Los Angeles Tacos, the thieves executed a grand slam, which subsequently broke the webpage. Called the shelled one back, and when play resumed, the grand slam was undone. Moreover, both teams now had an extra game played on their season card. This event was to be known as the Grand Unslam, and set a chain reaction of events at the end of the season that would open up new dimensions and replace the Los Angeles Tacos with a team full of white masons known as the Unlimited Tacos. When the Interviews Decree, which allows fans to see player stats when you click on them, is enacted, we were given the message, the microphone lifts. Error. The Grand Unslam weakened the bridge. Space-time tears over Los Angeles. The infinite cities shine. Platonic form corrupted. You've looked too close. There's more to this event that I don't have time to touch on, but it may be the most important event in baseball going forward. The other decree enacted is Eat the Rich. And from this point forward, the richest 1% of fans will have all their wealth redistributed to the 99% at the end of each season. And Hades Tigers pitcher, Yasmin Mason, developed a lust for blood that dramatically improved her pitching and go on to keep the Tigers on top. Season 4 returns after a two week long extended siesta, with the commissioner fixing the unlimited tacos so not every player is uncomfortably similar to the last. This was known as the Unmasoning. During the siesta, a goal was reached on the Blazeball Patreon, revealing the Five Blood Blackened Ball. Later on in the season, Sandy Turner of the New York Millennials met the requirements to obtain a Three Blood Blackened Ball. We have yet to find out what these represent, but a third is found in a later season. The finals was once again a face-off between the Hades Tigers and the New York Millennials, with the Tigers coming out on top and after their performance in the previous season, and correctly assumed performance in the current, one of the major decrees was an effort to weaken their hold on the championship. The taming of the Tigers did not pass, but they did face losses that would damage their performance in future seasons. The new weather effect, feedback, enables a chance for players on opposing teams to swap places and five-star hitter Jessica Telephone was swapped back from the Hades Tigers to the Philly Pies in exchange for Spears Taylor while 20 other players swapped over the course of the season of feedback. Only seven players were incinerated this season, and the decrees enacted are targeted shame. Shame, according to the Forbidden Book, is... Shame phase. If the home team scores the winning run in the bottom of the final inning, the away team must complete the game in shame, despite being mathematically eliminated. Targeted shame gives the team shamed, 
negative runs proportional to the amount of runs they lost by in the following game. In this case, targeted chain was applied to the top four teams in the league. The second decree was alternate reality, where one player from each team is replaced by an alternate version of themselves with completely different stats. This decree saw the Tigers ace pitcher Yasmin Mason lose her bloodlust and become a regular ass pitcher. The Tigers have reached the finals once since this event. The decree may not have passed, but the Tigers were in the end tamed. Season 5 was the season of Reverb. Reverb was yet another weather effect that in this case would shuffle the lineup of a team it affected. The season was claimed by the Chicago Firefighters overcoming the Breckenridge Jazz Hands to get to the top. All in all, it was an uneventful season, which is not a sentiment I can claim in the future. Two players were incinerated, one pair of players swapped into feedback, and the decrees had no descriptions so no one knew what they were voting for. High Filter was enacted, which began the bloodbath, most of the effects of which never came to fruition. There's no point explaining it because it never happened, but we did enter Season 6 with a new weather effect related to it, and another function of the League was unlocked. The biggest upset of the season did happen during the elections, when the Baltimore Crabs attained a large number of blessings and swiftly turned their team into an unstoppable juggernaut that cast an ominous shadow over baseball ever since. Season 6 was when we began engaging in idolatry at the discretion of the baseball gods. Every fan had the option to idolize any player in the league for various benefits. A ranking was established based on how many fans were idolizing each player, and something strange happened in response to this. The first incinerated player, Jalen Hotdog Fingers, climbed the ranks and settled into the 14 slot, which just so happened to coincide with a blessing that would enable a team to steal the 14th most idolized player in the league. We'll revisit this in Season 7, but for now let's talk about how players started draining each other's blood during games, obtaining boost to their stats and leaving the victims weaker. The Bloodbath Gurgles. During the season, we were revisited by the Shelled One, who took two of the top three idols and encased them in peanut shells, both of which remain to this day, even if Jessica Telephone escaped temporarily. Jumping to that, it turns out getting players out of shells are what the birds are for. That's about it. The third idol was Peanut Bong, suggesting that the peanut named players were precious to the shelled one. The Season 6 Championship, if nothing else, was a string of safe bets on the Baltimore Crabs as they won a record holding 80 games and dominated the league, including a brief final sweep against the Seattle Garages. The winning decree was enhanced party time, party time being when a team is mathematically eliminated from the championship, though they still play games the rest of the season. Enhanced party time enables partying players to receive buffs while playing the remaining games for the season. Four players were incinerated, 20 players swapped in the feedback. Season 7 is where it all went to hell. The necromancy was a success and Jalen Hotdog Fingers returned to her place in the Seattle garages, but at a terrible cost. There was a debt to be paid and every time Jalen hit a batter with a pitch, the chance of being incinerated during a solar eclipse rose exponentially. 14 players were incinerated over the course of the season, 12 of which were linked to Jalen. With minimal losses over the last few seasons, my own Hades Tigers lost four players, including the previous ace, Yasmin Mason, and team captain, Moody Cookbook. Some players barely got a chance to finish a week of games before being tragically murdered by Jalen's pitches. Though Jalen wasn't the only creature to emerge from the underworld, she was followed by the Monitor, a huge cephalopod that brought the Hall of Flame with it, a place where players can give their hard-earned peanuts in tribute to the Fallen. The fans have yet to figure out what this means, but there was a mysterious line after the 14th ranked player, suggesting this may be the makeup of some future undead nightmare team. In other parts of the league, the unlimited tacos were set to defy the baseball gods and coordinated with fans across the league to execute the Snacrifice. 
in which every pitcher in the taco's rotation was encased inside of a peanut shell, rendering it impossible to play against them, or so we thought. Along with pushing the taco's pitchers up, there was the peanut players which came out of the sacrifice freshly honey roasted. We have no idea what this means, but the shelled one emerged to mock us for our show of unity. As far as decrees go, with the crab's domination in the previous season still stinging, all decrees were tied to giving the top four teams a disadvantage, but the successful one was bless off, which prevents those top four from gaining any blessings in the current election. Speaking of crabs, the shelling of their two best players cost them the title, as the finals came down to the Mexico City Wild Wings versus the San Francisco Lovers, with the Wild Wings pulling it all in the end. It was a wild end to a wilder season. Also, only four players swapped in the feedback. Sorry, there was nowhere to fit that into that whole extravaganza, but let's maintain a bit of consistency, okay? In Season 8, Jalen's debt was refinanced, to the great relief of the entire league. Now, when she hit a player with a pitch, there was a greater chance to swap in feedback games. While this still made games tense, as fans didn't want to lose important players on their teams, it was considerably less dramatic by comparison. 20 players swapped teams over the course of the season. The subtitle for the season was Rest in Violence, in respect to the Hall of Flame, which at this point was dominated by Tigers legend Landry Violence, and recently deceased fan favourite Kansas City Breathmints player, Boyfriend Monreal. Monreal? I don't know, how do you pronounce it? And it's set to remain that way until baseball finds a new age of violence. The results of the sacrifice was the Taco's pitching role being filled by a literal pitching machine, which, thanks to idolatry, broke the whole economy. There were some shenanigans with that, and it drank some of the player's blood and apparently learned how to dance, but now it's encased in a peanut shell, so that brought a swift end to the tale of the pitching machine. Now it's Sexton Weirer's time to shine. After a slow start, and even after being blocked from obtaining any blessings the previous season, the Baltimore Crabs pulled ahead and once again took the championship in the finals against the Hades Tigers. At this point, Three teams have now won two championships, and the forbidden book states, if a team wins three championships, they and baseball shall ascend. And with the Tigers beating the Pies in the semi-finals this season, ascension has never been closer. During this season, only two players were incinerated, and in a strange set of circumstances, so was one of the umpires. Both a joyous and terrifying sentiment, as we know not what the cost of this transgression will be. The decree enacted was wild cards, where a random team will now join the playoffs each season for a special wild card series. And through some sheer miracle, the Baltimore Crabs were blocked from getting any new blessings for the second season in a row, to great relief. When the season ended, the shelled one appeared once more to berate our choice to give peanuts in tribute to the fallen. They called the fourth strike, and a week-long siesta began. Okay, I said earlier this would be a recap of seasons 1 to 8, but it took so long to edit this video, all of season 9 happened. And since the season opened with a notice saying it's the last act of the Discipline Era, it's only right to finish this out. So let's get some general stuff out of the way before the madness happens. Jalen, Nan, and Six-Pack Dogwalker were set to permanent flickering, which means they have a higher chance to swap in feedback. And with Jalen still a revenant, she's pelting teams all over the league. Though strangely, this time around, her pitches buffed players, allowing them to hit more than once in reverb weather. The streak continues until they get an out. Nan, who is believed to be the original Wyatt Mason, and Six Pack also obtained the modification Receiver and have been sending messages to the league through the pre game ritual portion of their player stats. This season saw changes to the peanut and bird weather, where large peanuts can fall and strike players, encasing them in shells 
and birds can now scare batteries away, resulting in an out. Quite a timely change with the election allowing fans to vote for the three weather patterns next season. And without these alterations, it would have been too easy to just vote for the three not harmful weathers. At the start of the season, there was a squid symbol next to the first shelled player on the idol board. And Polka Dot Patterson of the Canada Moist Talkers was offered as a sacrifice. But the monitor showed up, chewed a little and spit Polka Dot out leaving them with a permanent squiddish modification. Who knows what it does? The elections this season were rich in blessings that benefited multiple teams, and though I didn't mention at any point before, despite occasional appearances, numerous mystery blessings and possibly decrees. Apparently, each weather enacted also gave a weather-specific buff to one player on every team, making three buffs per team. At this point in time, many players boast equipment and buffs of all kinds. Whole divisions have buffs and debuffs, and the RPG aspects of baseball grow richer with each season. The only incineration this season was one of the crab's strongest, Tillman Henderson. The wildcard series went ahead, with the Hawaii Fridays and Chicago Firefighters joining the playoffs. The Hawaii Fridays broke the record this season for earliest to start partying, which means they lost a lot. This may be because they lost their best hitter in the previous election to the Tigers. Thanks to all that partying though, the Fridays put up quite a fight in a grudge match against the Tigers themselves. The finals came down to the Baltimore Crabs and Charleston Shoe Thieves, in a five game series that saw the Shoe Thieves snatch ascension from the claws of the Crabs, even with their freshly unshelled best hitter in the league. Immediately afterwards, however, was a surprising turn of events. The discipline era conclusion and the result of the fourth strike was the peanut players and every single shelled player rising up to form a super team with which the shelled one could beat the champions into the ground in what can only be described as a JRPG boss battle. With Jalen pitching for the shoe thieves, the shelled one's pods gave the team quite a thrashing with the final blow being delivered by none other than Jessica Telephone. All the while, and on a distant team, Nan told us to have hope. The final word was the shelled one challenging us to take it on, leaving the shoe thieves with a hefty round of debuffs and none of the pods returning to their original teams. And so, Season 10 would be happening when this video goes up, and the future is uncertain. I suppose now I talk about what keeps me going with this. I mean, all that storytelling's cool. With all the vibes of early 2010s community-driven pop culture making a comeback. But what really hooked me was the first time I sat down to watch one of the games play out. It was oddly engrossing. I got excited for the home runs and booed when the other team scored. Is this what liking sports is? Though I do enjoy the added benefit of games playing out in digestible chunks so you can get on with your day, the excitement is amplified when you join the Discord and join your team's watch party channel to yell and chant for your players and enjoy each other's company. This may go horribly wrong as most fandoms tend to, but the baseball community is full of nice, inclusive people who, even if they're mad at a team, they're nice to that team's fans. It's just such a worthy escape from the horrors going on in reality. This also marks the first time in years that I've taken part in a community. I guess that's mostly in a loose sense. Sure, I did a bit of fan art for an interpretation of the Tiger's hitter, Usurper Violet. Sure, I'm making this dang video to show my love and respect for this splort. But I wouldn't say I have a presence. I keep to my team's chat room, only half taking part in conversations and issuing one sentence response on an average of 0.3 an hour. But I'm there, in the drink. I'm watching it happen in real time, and it just feels so good. Finally, I need to shout out some stuff. First off, the commissioner, who is doing a great job, and provides updates on Twitter for important game events, while also responding in cryptic ways to bigger ones. 
the Blazeball News Network, which can keep you abreast of all Blazeball news without digging around the Discord for finer details. The Society for Blazeball Research for doing the hard work digging into the weird stuff the developers stuck into the code, and providing a lot of resources to allow others to do the same. Blazeball cares for doing good work for various charities and bringing the fans on board to spread the word. To all the fans producing content, with the colossal amount of fan art, the role-playing Twitter accounts for players, the band producing music as the Seattle Garages, and the people developing storylines for their teams and individual players. And thanks to the Blazeball Wiki for cataloging all of this and making it easier for me to gather information for this video. And of course, we can't forget the game band, the developer of this project, whom you can support directly by heading over to patreon.com slash blazeball. And while you're there, head on over to my page, patreon.com forward slash worldender, where I make comics and video reviews. Just thought I'd throw in some self-promotion now that this video is over.